I broke my second cervical vertebrae. Um, and I broke my collarbone and had a basilar skull fracture. So the bottom of my skull broke basically from ear to ear and I lost my hearing in my right ear. Um, so I immediately was in a coma. I had so much trauma to my brain. Like I had spinal fluid coming out of my nose and my ears and I got flight for life lifted to two different hospitals before they could keep me stable. And I was in a coma for nine days. Like, um, I was pronounced dead in the, in the helicopter. Um, they kept trying to resuscitate me. Once I got to the hospital, they were, I was stable, but I was in a coma. Um, and just an action and not, it's not, I wasn't put into a coma. I was, I physically could not, was not waking up. Um, and you know, they kept asking my parents, like, how long do you want to keep her on life support? Um, do you want her to be an organ donor? Um, it was like a really scary time for my family. Um, and then it was kind of crazy because like one day I just woke up. That is Livy Ron this week on the do it for yourself podcast. friend. How's it going today? For me, I'm still recovering a little bit because yesterday I actually did my very first cycle cross practice and I have never ridden a bike off the road before. I've always ridden a bike on the road. So this was uh, definitely a very interesting experience and a learning experience as well because I very quickly learned that through triathlon, it doesn't matter which side you mount and dismount on the bike at the line because you don't have to get off and get back on immediately. In cyclocross, that's a little bit different. So um, I'm looking forward to being the noob again and uh, getting a chance to really embrace this feeling of, oh my God, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, and I really need to practice at this a little bit more. So I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be exciting. Figured I'd give you a little update on my training since it's the off season and there's not too many triathlons going on here on the East Coast. My guest this week, my guest this week is Livy Ron. And I do owe Livy an apology because I kind of sounded like an idiot not knowing that a meat scientist was a legitimate career. I thought that Livy was a meat scientist. That was something that she had just called herself. Um, and I just completely didn't realize that. But Livy is a meat scientist. That is her full-time job. And she is also a registered dietitian. And she helps people with setting up their macros, um, maybe some weight loss, and she takes a different approach and that's how I found her and that's why I wanted to have her on the show. Not to mention she went through an amazing transformation herself um, from you know living on the streets and going through some really dark stuff to now having a very successful career and a very successful coaching business. So I'm looking forward to sharing this episode with you. I hope that you enjoy and if you get a chance please do me a favor and just leave us a little bit of a re review when you're done this episode or while you're listening to this episode. Here is my conversation with Livy. Cool. So let's do it. Livy, I just want to say thank you so much for jumping on with me and working through some of the technical difficulties that we had right off the bat there. Yeah. Um, I usually try and use the link that I sent you the first time around because as we have also discovered, some people haven't used Skype for mm -hmm. an extended amount of time. <laughs> and so it's a little bit difficult and it's not something that's readily available. A lot of people don't have Skype installed on their compu computer. So I went with that. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work. So thank you for coming on and thank you so much for working through that with me. I do really appreciate it. Of course. And so the first thing that I have to ask you about, because this is something that popped up very recently, 
um, or at least maybe it's just something that I noticed recently um, through some of the things that you've been posting on Instagram. Um, you consider yourself a meat scientist. And mm -hmm. from what I can tell, um, you're kind of fighting back against people who are saying that meat is not good and that you should stay away from it and that it, it's essentially that it's bad for you. Um, that's my general possibly misinformed assumption. Um, so could you just explain for myself and for the listener what a meat scientist is? Sure. So if you think about it, it's kind of a crazy concept, but anytime you open up a cow, swim gyms don't pop out at you, right? Like, right. So it actually takes a scientist to develop those food products. And so just like a food scientist or any other business, economics, whatever, any degree, um, I have a master's in meat science and muscle biology, and then I um, pursued a PhD in that as well. So um, I am a meat scientist. Um, I'm currently in the midst of a like kind of like a nutrition epidemiology PhD program that ties in a lot of my meat science background as well. Um, so the big thing is people don't realize like that is what I went to grad school forever to learn about. And it's not just some like self-declared, oh, I'm a meat scientist. Like it's like a, an actual course of study that like it has its own published journal. Um, people do extensive research on it because it co when it comes to it, like it has everything to do from live animal to what's on your plate. So, um, animal husbandry, genetics, um, animal feeding animal welfare, um, just overall raising of commercial livestock, um, slaughter techniques, animal, I said animal welfare, but um, food microbiology, packaging. So understanding the difference between like when you go to the grocery store and you see a like a, an overwrap package, it's like a tray with a saran wrap over it versus a map package, a modified atmosphere package, which is a plastic, hard, firm plastic bottom where you have to peel the plastic off. Um, understanding different seasoning blends, different functional ingredients, understanding how to make processed meats, the different equipment involved, how to actually make a hot dog. Like I would say if you ask most people in their kitchen or like how, like, can you please take this, take this piece of meat and make me a hot dog, they would have no idea where to start. So everything, every single part of that process is where a meat scientist is involved to make sure that we're able to keep food products safe, have long shelf life and taste good and be able to raise the animals in a humane and, you know, great way using every single part of that animal. And even meat science even in, um, encompasses animal byproducts. So people don't realize like pretty much everything that doesn't go, we use every single part of the animal. So everything that doesn't go into actual food processing turns out to like either, like there's animal products in plastics, in sealant in paint in like violin strings like animal products go everywhere and meat scientists also figure out what to do with animal byproducts as well so this is not just i mean i was misinformed i guess or i just assumed incorrectly that this was like a, yeah, it was like a self-proclaimed thing. Like I'm a meat scientist and I'm fighting against, you know, these people who are saying that it's bad. I had no, no idea that. I have published research in, the, in, in this field of study. <laughs> wow. So this is, and like you said, this is what you are going to school and, and this is your, what you're studying your PhD in. Yeah. So, you know, what I did, I, I, I did my undergrad um, in animal and meat science at West Texas A&M did my master's at Texas Tech University, left, um, decided I wanted to go back to school to become a registered dietitian, became, got a master's in nutrition, in nutrition dietetics, um, and then pursued then a PhD in nutritional epidemiology, as, which tied in a lot of the stuff that I'm doing with meat science. So it was kind of like a, a hybrid meat science nutri nutrition PhD program. And so it's, it's really interesting because a lot of people think that I have a fake job, but like my full time, like I'm a, I'm a rich dietitian on the side and I own a business, but full time, I'm a, my, my title is I'm a senior meat scientist. Um, I work for a company that sells functional ingredients. So like ingredients that go into processed meat products and I actually travel to different meat processing facilities and help them 
develop and optimize their products. So um, like we work with really, really large commercial manufacturers and help them like make better products that are either taste better, function better, um, have longer shelf life. So we have less food waste. And that's my full-time job. I am a meat scientist full-time. That is very, very interesting. I had no idea. And see, I think that I, I would have to say that I'm probably not in the minority. I would have to say that there's a lot of people that didn't realize that when you go and buy that package of ground beef or you buy that package of burgers or you buy that package of hot dogs, that there is this much that goes into it behind the yeah. scenes. I think that people just assume like, oh yeah, like they know, okay, yep, it comes from a cow. Yep, it comes from a pig, whatever. But that's just, oh, that's just this ground up part or, oh, that's just that. And they, they don't realize how much really goes into it. Right, because the sad part is is that um, less than 2% of people now in the United States have any direct relationship to actually raising or growing their food themselves. So being so far removed from the actual manufacturing of food makes people have this like idealized version of like where their food comes from or how it should be made when they have no idea where it even comes from in the first place. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, so because it's not 1950 anymore like there's no more farmers they're like that like there are farmers but like you don't see them every like they're in rural america farming your food mm -hmm. um so when i'm like yeah i live in chicago and i'm a meat scientist everyone like for example on my dating app everyone's like oh is that a euphemism i'm like no no <laughs> this is <your> real job <laughs> oh so man. yeah i know so it's like um People need to understand that like there's so much that goes into our food that um, in terms of just education and science and making sure that it's safe. And I'm so passionate about that um, because you, I think I was going to say ahead. you can you can clearly see that passion even just from written word on your Instagram. Great, um, because I really try to convey that because I just have so many people coming to me with questions like. Is organic really better for you? What about grass fed or animals abused? Um, what do you feel about glyphosate? You know, what do you feel about this? And it's always like this uphill battle because people, because people don't know where their food comes from, they're going to believe Dr. Google, right? And mm -hmm. there are so many people popping out of the woodworks who also have no idea anything about food. And they just are perpetuating this fear mongering with no data. You pull up like an actual published research journal, you actually read research, you'll see that all these people on Instagram are idiots. And it's really sad to just see them constantly, perpetually talking about these ridiculous topics where you're like, this is dumb. But you actually sound dumb. If you actually read research, you would know that everything you're saying is just pure dumb. <laughs> yeah, I think it was actually yesterday and it was you and... and I guess it was one of your other followers as well. Um, I don't know that you were necessarily involved. You may have just been reposting it, but there is this account and I, I mean, we don't need to get into who the account is, but yeah. there's an account on Instagram who has a very high number of followers. I mean, we're talking about like, yeah. I'm pretty sure like hundreds of thousands of followers. Mm -hmm. And I started reading through it because I'm like, you know what? Let me just see what this is this is all about, right? Like let me see what this person is posting about and then then I, I want to see the other side of it and see what people are saying. And I could see how if I were just reading it as an everyday person who was getting ready to start making school lunches for their kids, I would be like, "Oh my god, I can't feed my kids that because you care about your kids. You don't want to feed them something that's absolutely terrible. But then as I started to read what people were saying, where they were pointing out, you know, the inconsistencies in what they were talking about, I'm like, man, it, the way that this person is writing this, it definitely, like, it seems believe. It's not even seems believable. It's a hundred percent believable. Like you would think that that right. person is highly educated and really knows what they're talking about. Um, when, it kind of seems like that's not the case, but even as just a, 
somebody who's jumping on Instagram and that's following another mommy blog, which I'm not saying that that's what this person was doing, but if you jump on and you start reading these things, you know, you're going to look at the number of followers they have and how many likes they get and, and all these metrics that don't really matter. And you're going to say, oh, well, this person, they must know what they're talking about because look at all these people who are following them and listening to them. So it's, right. it's just this, it's a very murky gray area of, you know, who can we listen to? What, what can we follow? And is there necessarily things that are good versus bad? Yeah, it's, it's really hard, right? Because there are all these people who are like, they think they're trying to do what's right, but they just don't know. And there are a lot of times there are people who are like, oh, grass fed is so much better. Grass fed, grass. I'm like, have you actually ever been to a feedlot? Like a commercial 70,000 head operation for a feedlot? Have you ever seen animal slaughter? Do you know anything about it? Do you know anything about muscle muscle conversion, right? Because there's a big difference between muscle and meat. Mm -hmm. Like in the conversion of muscle to meat and the actual, you know, biological changes that happen in terms of pH that allows it to, you know, be a steak. Do you, do you understand that? Do you understand muscle biochemistry? No, no, no. Mm. Like I, I don't go to my dentist and, and ask him to fix my, you know, my pipes or I don't go to my plumber and ask him to fix my teeth. Right. The same thing with, you shouldn't go to someone with a blog to tell you about where your food comes from. You should go to a food scientist. Mm -hmm. You should go to a meat scientist or go to a farmer. Physically go to a conventional farmer and be like, Hey, like, I would love to learn more about this operation. And most of them will be like, sure, come out. But you also have to go to like Hereford, Texas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, where I actually worked, well, Friona, Texas, I worked on a 70,000 head seed lawn. Um, and where you see these animals, right? And think of 70,000 cattle in one space, right? Um, and not a single one of them was abused, angry, you watch them every, my job was to literally watch them every day, ride on my horse from pen to pen, making sure that every single animal was healthy, safe, and had no problems. They were so happy. They're happy as a clam. Cattle are herd animals, right? They don't, they genuinely don't want big open spaces. They are animals of prey. What happens in a big open space? They are hunted. So they actually prefer to be in really small clumps. We were are driving by for the most part. You'll see cattle all standing together in a clump because that's how they want to be. Mm -hmm. Because how that's their defense mechanism, right? They all clump together. So they're like, okay, like we'll put the weakest, the oldest, and the youngest in the middle and all the older ones and all the younger and um, like, you know, able-bodied on the outside. So if like a wolf or a coyote or anything comes at us, we're safe. And that's exactly what they do in pens. And if you put them in a field, I guarantee if you put them in a field, they're not going to be spread out because it is dangerous for a cow to be by itself. No, I just saw it the other day, actually. Now, I don't yeah. have I don't have anywhere where we have 70,000 cows, but I live in a, a fairly like rural area. And I was driving up towards Lancaster, PA, which is where they have, you know, it's where all the sure. Amish are. So there's there's tons of yeah. farms and stuff out there. Um, and actually I was driving past this one particular farm and I noticed that there was a, a small herd of cows. I mean, we're probably talking about six to seven cows, but they were all exactly what you just said. They were all clumped together and they were all hanging out underneath of like this giant tower that had probably it was for electrical wires and stuff. And they were all just herded mm -hmm. together, hanging out under there. Clumped. Yeah. It. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we basically, and the USA has a minimum requirement for space for animals. So it's not like you can just like cram them anywhere. You have to have, give them enough space. They have tons of space to walk around. And the coolest thing is in each one of these pens, there's like these little mounds. And they, these animals have personalities. They're kind of funny. Like they'll play like king of the mound, right? And so you'll see different animals go to the top of the mound and they're playing and they're living their best lives and they're eating grains and they're happy. Like, you don't go there and see, like, miserable animals because at the end of the day, it is a business, right? 
we are not making money off miserable animals Mm -hmm. because just like humans, when you're miserable, you're not performing well, you're not digesting your food well, you know, same thing with these. We want them to be happy, healthy, and converting that, literally, that energy that they're taking in via food into muscle. So if they're miserable, sick, unhappy, they're not converting food into muscle, and that's our bottom dollar. So it's in our best interest to make sure those animals are happy, healthy, well-fed, and hydrated. And so actually to that to that note and being miserable and not performing well, um, we were joking about when your your Skype picture is from, but your Skype picture is probably from um, a time. Like a nine. <laughs> well, it was, I was going to say it was probably from around a time um, where you were feeling some of those same things as well, because you you from about 11 years ago, you made a very, very significant change. Now, it didn't happen overnight. It took a very mm-hmm. long time. It took the full 11 years to kind of get to where you are right now. But I want to track back and get to where Livy is now and being a meat right. scientist um, and and go through your story because – I think that you have a very, very powerful one. Um, So I want to start with kind of where you were in that junior, senior high school time period, um, getting ready to probably graduate high school. And did, did you go on to college? Because I know you said you went to college, but did you go immediately after high school? Sure. So um what i'll kind of like kind of go to a different i'll get to where i went to college um but so in 2006 i was involved in a i've been riding horses since i was like before i could walk i i have a horse now i've been riding riding horses my entire life like i literally i feel like before i could walk was on the back of a horse my cousin rode horses and i always remember just being fascinated by them my mom would take me every weekend to this little pony ride place and like hold me and I just loved horses my whole life and um I was really competitive when I was younger and that's probably the one thing keeping me sane and I was a fairly good kid up until this point and um I was riding my horse and it was a hot summer day June 3rd 2006 and we were cool we had just gotten done jumping around um and I and so I would, my friend was on my horse and I was on her horse and cause we switched horses. It's her horse was like acting up or something. And, um, we were running parallel. We were like walking parallel to a road in like a fence grass path. And a truck drives by and honks a horn at a car in front of it or something and spooks the horse that I'm on. The horse that I'm on then at a full gallop, um, head takes off towards the barn, you know, cause like that's home and she's scared. And horses have four metal shoes on. And so when that horse hit concrete, metal on concrete has no traction um, at a full gallop, especially 40 miles an hour, um, loses traction, rolls over on top of me. And I broke my neck. Um, I broke my second cervical vertebrae. Um, and I broke my collarbone and had a basilar skull fracture. So the bottom of my skull broke basically from ear to ear. And I lost my hearing in my right ear. Um, so I immediately was in a coma. I had so much trauma to my brain. Like I had spinal fluid coming out of my nose and my ears. And I got flight for life lifted to two different hospitals before they could keep me stable. And I was in a coma for nine days. Like um, I was pronounced dead in the, in the helicopter. Um, they kept trying to resuscitate me. Once I was, got to the hospital, they were, I was stable, but I was in a coma. Um, and just an action and not, not, I wasn't put into a coma. I was, I physically could not, was not waking up. Um, and you know, they kept asking my parents, like, how long do you want to keep her on life support? Um, do you want her to be an organ donor? Um, it was like a really scary time for my family. Um, and then it was kind of crazy because like one day I just woke up and I had to go through tons of occupational therapies because I would, it was crazy. My friends would come and visit me. Um, in my hospital room and in the time that they would visit me and they would like go to the pop machine or something and grab a soda and they would come back 
um, I before I came back, I'd be like, oh, how come my friends ever come and visit me? My short term memory was that bad. I would already forget wow. that they were physically in the room because I, I my brain was like white. It basically my hit like a hit like a big reset. Like everyone even says, like my personality from before and after the accident is different. And like I have, I physically don't remember any memories um, before, like before then. I, I just remember the story that people have told me, if that makes sense. Like I physically don't remember being a child, right? I just remember the stories of being a child. Um, and it, it just changes you, right? And I was in this giant neck brace. I couldn't move my limb, my limbs really well and I had to go through tons of occupational therapy to learn how to walk how to go to the bathroom I had a horrible bladder problem where I couldn't I had to go to the bathroom literally at the same exact time every day where I'd pee my pants um and I was like my word choice is all out of order like I was like basically Yoda but not on purpose you Mm -hmm. know like my words were kind of all scrambled up and I had to um really learn how to talk again walk again um colors who my parents were who like basic very basic things my brain just basically did like it was like i was a newborn child right? Jeez, just, you forgot literally. everything yeah my brain is at a giant reset wow and think about the trauma that happened yeah to it, though, you know yeah. so oh, yeah. i had i had four major brain contusions i had really bad um bleeding inside my brain as well as the front of and my brain hit the front of my skull, the back of my skull, and the front of my skull again. So basically my whole brain just got rattled. Um, and I suffered dr- dr- dramatically. And even, and I had a really bad stutter. And it's gotten a lot better. I mean, you know, it's been several years since 2006, 13 years. So my stutter isn't as noticeable anymore, but it used to be really bad. Um, and still to this day, I walk kind of crooked. I have a really hard time walking straight because I am deaf in my right ear. And it throws off like my balance a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of things that are just kind of that are a little bit weird about me. But um, yeah, you know, it's crazy coming from kind of trauma like that. Um, and I had a big neck brace. And so what happened is eventually when I was allowed to go back to school, um, I was allowed to go back. I was in high school um, to like two classes a day because I couldn't handle like walking in the hallways. I went to a really big high school, yeah, like, graduating yeah. class. I graduated in class of like a thousand. So I couldn't handle walking in the hallway. So I, I basically had a tutor and then um, who would come to my house. And then I would go to like two classes a day and I would come and go after like the walking period. But people would see me um, and everyone made fun of me. Everyone was really mean. They're high school kids, not to like excuse the behavior, but there's a girl in a neck brace. I was like set up to be made fun of, mm-hmm. right? No, oh, we've, and I I've, felt like, I've talked about it so many times on the podcast, how like middle school and high school, it seems like middle school kids get really mean, but then in high school you find your cliques and you find your true friends. So you don't really care about the people who are making fun of you. But in that situation, yes, you, you were, you were basically just walking right into a trap, you know, right. going into high school Fine. like that. Right. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was pretty, pretty bad. And I just perpetually kept, you know, having, getting bullied, feeling horrible, um, people being really mean to me. And it was awful. Um, and really the only people that I assimilated well with at this point, um, like people kept calling me a crippled whore. Like, and I was like, I'm six, 15, 16 years old. Like, what? You know, like I just got like, like people were so mean. And um, really the only people that I associated well with were like this like weird group of outcasts that were basically all doing drugs. So, or like I had some friends who like weren't doing drugs, but never told me to not do drugs. And so, and they're the only ones who were nice to me. And I was like, well, these people are nice to me and drugs aren't so bad. So cool. And I just got bad into drugs. It just started with like smoking weed every now and then. And then it got really bad when my one friend in high school killed himself and like we found his body and it was this horrible traumatic experience. Um, and it was a spiral from there, right? Next thing you know, I'm using drugs, stealing drugs. Um, like I didn't have money. So I was like selling my body for drugs. It was a horrible experience, you know? And then I was just completely out of control. I was like, 
not going to not going to school. Um, and I would, but it was crazy because like getting decent grades in high school is kind of smart. Um, and I was able to like basically put in zero effort in class and still do well. And so I uh, I just kept like skipping class, kind of showing up bare minimum, like doing drugs, and eventually. I was like working in a grocery store. My parents picked me up one day from from work, and I was like, "Why the hell are you guys here?" I said, "My car is here. I can drive home." Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like 16, and they picked me up, and they're like, "Well, it was like a week before my birthday." They're like, "Oh, we're taking you for a birthday surprise," and I was like, "Whatever, okay." And I was tired, so I was like, "I'm going," because I probably was up. Like, who knows? Doing God knows what. Mm-hmm. Um, and they drove me to a random city in Keokuk, Iowa where they dropped me off for a year. I was admitted into like a, basically a rehab center um, to get sober. So I basically from my 17th to 18th birthday was in a really full rehab um, in the middle of nowhere in Keokuk, Iowa, which is basically jail. You couldn't go outside, couldn't look in the mirror, couldn't, you were only allowed to talk for like 15 minutes a day. You were in silence pretty much the entire day. You were just going to school. You were like either talking to a therapist, like a, I'm using the, I'm using the word therapist loosely, not an actual therapist, but like a adult. Um, like a and counselor. Like going to, yeah, you're going to different seminars, and that was it. Like you were basically in jail, like kid jail. And um, so, between that and um, going to, then I left when I was 18. And my parents were kind of like, I left rehab on not good terms. So they couldn't keep me there anymore once you turn 18. Mm -hmm. And I had almost graduated the program. And because I was almost 18, they put me in this like program where you could have a job and you could like work at this gas station um, and like learn real life skills. Because people in this this program were anywhere between 12 and 18. So because I was on the older end, like I was able to like kind of do this like in-between program. Um, and I ended up meeting a boy and we basically like, I was like, like going back into bad behavior. Like we, I was working in a gas station. I could smoke, I could, I could steal cigarettes in the gas station, smoke cigarettes. I saw boys. So I could like do things with boys, you know, I was just like out of control. And like, we got caught and they're basically, you can go back to being a level one, which was like a horrible idea, or you can leave because you're 18. So I left. And, um, my parents like we don't want you in our house like absolutely not you're an out of control 18 year old you're an adult go be an adult so i lived in section 8 housing so low-income housing illegally because i met someone who who was like living in section 8 housing and she was like yeah you can live with me if you watch my kids at night or something and i was like sure i what did i know how to do i knew how to sell drugs mm-hmm. um i went right back into selling drugs and doing the same exact thing i was doing living in low income housing Somehow got myself enrolled in community college, like 2008 at this point. Um, got myself involved in enrolled in community college. I was going to community college. It was super easy. I didn't struggle at school. It was smart. Um, and I started dating someone who he was like, "I don't drink. I don't smoke. If you don't stop doing this ridiculous shit, like we're not. I'm not dating you anymore." So and I was like, ah. I was gonna say. Uh, well, actually, I I did I have two questions because I want to know if living in the Section Eight housing, do you do you think because you were in that environment again, you went back, you just went right back to it? Or yeah, I mean, it's it's not good living in Section Eight housing. It's a bunch right. of like honestly like low low income people with kids who are also smoking, not doing anything with their lives. That's not motivating to be there. Right. You're like these people are all poor. This house is not nice. And I'm, I'm not, I, I, I can't confirm nor deny, but I, I don't know, because it seemed like across the street, there was like legitimately a meth lab because there were like cop cars there all the time. And I was young and I was cute and I was in good shape. And I was like hooking up with some of the patrol officers so I could like, because they knew I wasn't supposed to be living there. Uh. Uh, so like, but like I was hooking up with some of the patrol officers who were like patrolling the area. So I could like, I was basically coming and going if I please. No one would take it in my car. It was bad. I was like living out of my car slash Section 8 housing, working part-time at Radio Shack and trying to go to community college. Um, 
And so, this, and, well, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll let you finish that point. Yeah. So, I, and, you know, I went to the doctor because I had to, like, you know, go to the gynecologist for, you know, just a regular woman exam. And my doctor was like, you know, like, you look like tweaked out of your mind. Like, if you don't stop doing drugs, like, you're going to die. And it wasn't until then, and, and because I, for whatever reason, it was very strange. Like, I was 18 years old and never had a period. And I always thought it was normal. I was fairly athletic and I was really skinny because I was doing a lot of cocaine and like I didn't really eat that much. And I was like, ah, whatever. And so she's like, my gynecologist, like, no, we, should, we need to do some testing. Like, you're 18 years old. Like, you should be having a period. And um, turns out I had ovarian cancer at a very young age, which was um, very, it's very abnormal to have that at age 18. So she's like, if you don't stop doing what this lifestyle that you're doing, you're going to die. And I was like, holy shit. Right? Like, I was like, oh my God. I don't, the last thing I want to do is die. Right. Uh, so, and I was, like I said, I started dating that guy who was like, I'm sober. I don't, I don't even drink alcohol. He was 21, just turned 21. I don't drink alcohol. I don't, I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. Like, if you don't stop doing this shit, like, I'm not going to live, I'm not going to tolerate you. Cause I basically started living with him. Uh, I transitioned to kind of living with him and, um, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm getting sober. Um, that's what I, much- that's what I wanted to ask you about was, was this guy, because this seems like it would be, it, it's somebody one. Um, did you just meet at school? Like, is that how you guys met? So interestingly enough, I, I knew him, I knew him in high school because I knew one of his friends. I used to work at target. Okay. As like, when I was like in high school, I worked at Target or like right out of high school, like working at Target. And uh, I knew one of his friends and I really liked one of his friends. And then his one friend didn't really like me. And um, I got out of rehab. And when I got out of rehab, um, cause I was talking to him before we, uh, I went to rehab. And then when I got out of rehab, I was like, hey, I'm back home. It'd be cool to see you. Blah, blah. He's like, yeah, sure. And then we just ended up started dating. Um, and he was like, he's obviously he's married and um we're not together now but um no he, he definitely saved my life in a lot of ways and so did you simply reach out to this guy just because you liked one of his friends and that didn't work out so you're like oh okay well let me like let me see what he's up to because yeah. it seems yeah. like this would not be the kind of person that you would be attracted to at this point in your life. I mean, like you're well, the, no you're the bad like girl. Like her. you're, yeah. you know, like I you're out there just, sober. yeah. Okay. Um, he was just really hot. So okay. <laughs> I was like, Oh, he's really hot. He like, you know, it was like super muscular and like, I was really into that mm-hmm. and, um, looked like he had his shit together. So I was like, well, and like he had a place. So I was like, well, I could live here. And he's hot, and like I'm cute, so I'm, if anything, I can manipulate him to sleep with me, and let me stay this place for a while, and maybe we'll date, and then he'll let me stay here forever. Mm-hmm. Um, and then next thing you knew, I was like, man, I actually really like this person. And then I got sick, right? And then I was like, I need to get my life together, and um, basically um, got sober. Like, I mean, I celebrated my twenty. We dated for um, four over four years. Um, and I celebrated my 21st birthday sober. Like we went to like IHOP for breakfast. We went to like a pending, my, my birthday is in October. We like, picked pumpkins. Um, we like just like did normal things and had nothing to do with alcohol. Um, because he definitely helped me get sober. So what I do want to ask you about, you know, with him helping you get sober versus your parents tried to help you as well, but do you think that once you got out of that program and left, you bounced right back and not necessarily because of the environment you were in, you know, section eight housing or anything like that. But do you think that that approach and that environment didn't work for you? Like that just wasn't, it wasn't resonating with you. That program wasn't yeah. what was going to work for you. Yeah, the program's actually shut down now. Uh, because like one of the owners was like molesting some of the girls, like the whole program is like, was pretty messed up. Um, it's like not a good program. It doesn't really give you skills on how to like transition out, transition out of that program. It's almost so restrictive that like 
what happens when you get out is you just go back to being insane because you're like, oh my God, all this has been gone for me for this long. And it's sad because I see a lot of the girls who are also in the same program with me and they're not doing well. Or, you know, and they, they got out and went back to what they were doing or they didn't go to college or they had a bunch of kids. Obviously, there's, a bunch, there's some outliers. There's some girls who are doing really well. But there's a lot of girls who aren't. Um, and it's sad, but that program is no longer in existence. It's called Midwest Academy. Um, and in Keith, Iowa. And it, it was just a really sad, sad program. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it wasn't, it, it just definitely didn't set me up for success. Like I got out and my parents, like my mom, like she was like, I, she's not even in my life now, but like, she's like, I can't deal with you. Like you're too much. I don't want you living with me. Um, and my dad was living in California and he was kind of like, I don't know how to help you. I live in California slash Israel and I travel so much for my job. Like, I don't know what to do. I can like give you some money, um, help you get you on your feet. But like, I, I can't really do anything. So I was like, well, I'm, I'm a freaking adult. Like, you know, a normal 18 year old thinking they understand how the world works. Mm -hmm. I can do everything myself. And, um, got cancer and I ended up dating Kyle, my, my boyfriend. And I got my life together and Kyle was like finishing up his undergrad when I was, um, in community college and he like I was like you know what I've always wanted to I always wanted to go to vet school and so I actually started um like when I started undergrad it was because I wanted to be a veterinarian and I was like I was like you know what I'm getting my life together I'm going to school school is really easy I'm doing well in school Kyle's like telling me how great I'm doing I'm like I'm going through treatment right now it's like going better um I'm sober um I was riding horses again. And so I ended up going to West Texas A&M for undergrad. I got, I got a scholarship to ride on their equestrian team. So I rode horses for them. And I started out as an animal science major, um, hoping to go to vet school. And that's where I got super passionate. Cause you have to take like an animal, you take animal science, a livestock class and all kinds of stuff like that. And I got super passionate about meat and like how we raise animals for food, how you produce food, how you make food that I was like, you know what? I want to get a PhD in this. I want to like go to school forever for this and learn everything I can about it so I can teach consumers and people that what they think they know about food isn't right and so um Kyle came to Texas and lived with me and he worked on a master's there while I was finishing up my bachelor's and then um, I ended up going to we ended, we ended up breaking up but we I ended up going to Texas Tech then for a master's in, in meat science and um, then I ended up getting really passionate about like food and nutrition because I got super into weightlifting and um, doing that and so then I decided I was like I want to be a dietitian and then I was like now I want to get a PhD in um, epidemiology, nutritional epidemiology and um, tie in kind of some of my meat science background in that. So what really when you were going through your classes and you switched over what was it about this that that really pulled you in? Like, what was the part, or was it more, it, it could have been more than one part that was like, oh, okay, th this is what I want to pursue, and, and this is why I want to pursue it. So I actually had um, a professor, Dr. Ty Lawrence, at West Texas A&M University, um, who was an amazing professor, and, um, he uh, he just basically would talk to me about the kids. I took my visit, my very first semester there. I took a food science course, and he kind of talked about how food manufacturing and kind of like a commercial scale. And I was always asked questions. I was such a pain in the ass. I was like, "Well, what about this? And what about glyphosate? And what about organic? You know, and like all these things." And he just presented me with data, and I was like, "Holy shit!" You know, like this this is nothing that I knew growing up in the suburbs of Chicago. And now that I, and I like went to a feedlot and I saw cattle, and I saw pigs and I saw how we handle them. I saw how we slaughter and I saw all these things. And I was like, this is insane. This is exactly, you know, what I want to do and want to learn. I just grew so passionate about it. So it wasn't even necessarily like, 
one thing that's that kind of sparked your interest it was you went and had a chance to see everything you had a professor who was giving you all of this information and, and kind of backing up some of the things that he was saying it was kind of like this culmination of events that really brought out your passion for, for the meat science yeah a hundred percent because it was like all i wanted to do was learn more about meat science learn more about what i could you know how food is manufactured learn more about everything because i was like wow this professor just like totally blew my mind mm -hmm. and i felt like it was so important to kind of teach more people about where their food comes from because most people have no idea like you didn't even know a meat scientist was a thing i had no idea you know? mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that makes me really, really excited to teach and educate people about that, you know? And how important do you think it was to have that professor who gave you that spark and gave you that initial introduction into this? One million percent. It, without him, I probably wouldn't have been this passionate or excited. Dr. Ty Lawrence at West Texas a and University, and he probably hated me. <laughs> that was such a pain in the ass. Every single question, because I'm very outspoken. Every single question he had, every single, you know, statement he made, I would always, I was that girl, like, in the front row, always raising my hand. Always like, well, what about this? And what about that? And what do you think about this? You know, and it was just like, um, it was a very interesting thing. And then eventually I was like, you know what? This guy's right. And, and he was, and I just kept over time, like doing a lot of my own research and I worked at a feedlot and I, and I like met other people who worked around agriculture and livestock and how this was their, their livelihood. And I just learned so much that there was no way that I could um, not pursue this as a, as a career field. And I just, I'm so passionate about meat science in general and how we manufacture meat on a, on a, on a global scale. And as you were going through your undergrad and then your master's, did you simultaneously do your schooling to become a registered dietitian or did you have so was, one undergrad and then, okay. So I, I did undergrad. I went straight undergrad grad school for meat science. Mm -hmm. I went to work for a year at a company that I didn't really enjoy. And I was like, mm, I'm going to go back to grad school. And when I was in grad school to become a dietitian and working full time at a different position, um, because I'd already had, you know, had enough credits, I just needed to take a few one-off courses to become a dietitian and then do my clinical hours. So um, I did that while pretty much working full time. I did all those things, and then I was like, I'm so excited I'm becoming a dietitian because now I can tie in my passion for meat science and meat and meat manufacturing and tie that with nutritional science, um, and kind of bring and like kind of marry the two bodies of science together. And because you, if, you were to, if you were to ask a bunch of dietitians, you know, where their food comes from, you know, and how they manufacture food, they don't know. They're also singing the praises of organic grass-fed mm -hmm. and all this stuff because they don't know. And so that's where I feel like I have a very, um, you know, specific niche education that allows me to understand the best of both worlds. Yeah, I was going to say, it, it probably helps you immensely one yeah. one helps the other you know but i would say that the the meat science probably helps the dietitian side a little bit more because you can connect with your clients and you can explain things that you know just a, an everyday person is not going to know and even to the extent that i'm sure a lot of registered dietitians aren't going to know either and so right. you have the ability to connect with them on a much higher level, educate them about where things are coming from, and also debunk some of the things that they have gone and read on the internet, or some of the things that they've been told and some of the things that they've been following for such a long time. And it's not necessarily their fault, and they can't be you know, it's not something that, that they have known because, like you said, I didn't even know there was such thing as meat scientists. They might be going on and reading something online that's published by somebody who they think knows what they're talking about. And granted, I would have to say even the people who are publishing those things, 
they're probably not publishing it with ill intent. Or they're they're not right. no. putting misinformation out there on purpose. They just aren't as educated. Don't know. Right. So I think that the worst it's, though is when you try to call them out and you're like, hey, like here's some real data, or here's a journal, or here's talking about this, and they're like, nope, not believing it. Mm. And you're like, okay, now you're now you're actually just dumb. Right. So it's hard when you're like, here's like real data and facts and like research. And you're like, no, toxins. It has mm-hmm. toxins. I'm like, can you please tell me what the hell a toxin is? Because not a real thing. <laughs> Side note. Um, the one that really gets me is the the detox, like, and all these detoxes that people go through, and those fancy pads, those fancy pads that you put on the bottom of your feet that pull all of the toxins out of your body. Oh God! <laughs> oh, drink water. Yeah, I know. I digress. We don't have to get into that because we could do probably another hour's worth of podcasting just on some of the crazy things that we see on the internet that that aren't necessarily true. Um, So you, but yeah, I I went to school forever. Uh huh. And I got I you know I got a great job and I I've been kicked out of pretty much everywhere. Uh, I got a now I have a great job working in sales. I started a business last year. helping people mostly athletes well, with a lot of athletes but mm-hmm. kind of getting over the, the fear mongering around food or even when it comes to like carbs are bad or like you need to eat less and move more and like just shrink yourself until you feel good and you know I, I really try to help women just like take up space and get strong and like debunk some of this like crap out there about food and um so between that I just you know I moved downtown Chicago I got a condo, got decided to buy myself a fancy car and get a really cool license plate. Um, Which I love, I like, by the way. Yeah, it says eat, meat, my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> and, um, you know, I just decided I have a horse and I'm just, you know, living my best life. And it's crazy to think like how in even 10 years, if you were to ask me, like if you looked back 10 years ago, like if I, for, for right now, I'm sitting in, we, in a WeWork I don't work in an office anymore. I am in a shared office space, creating and cultivating the life of my dreams and doing everything that I want to be doing. Like this morning, I rode the subway downtown Chicago to a WeWork, walked here, coffee in hand with, you know, the only debt that I have is some student debt, but like paid off all my credit cards and I'm literally living my best life. I, you, I I would tell you that you were crazy if you, if, you, if I, there's no way I could see myself doing exactly what I'm doing right now 10 years ago because I was so lost. And that's why whenever someone says, like, I don't know, man, I'm in a really rough spot. There's no way that I can do that. Like, maybe you've always had it easy. I'm like, honey, take a freaking seat. Like, I have not had it easy. Um, and I had to work really hard for these things. But if you just work hard day in, day out and really commit to doing it and having a goal and having a vision you can do it because if, if i'm anything i'm a <laughs> i've shown that you know adversity is not a killer it's just a challenge mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. absolutely and so looking now looking forward do you see yourself just continuing to do the nutrition work that you do on the side or do you think that that could potentially become your full time i mean maybe um i mean i have i have employees and my business is doing really well and i absolutely love what i do but i also i mean i will say i love me science Mm -hmm. you know and i think working in my sales job that allows me to be um you know i i work from home unless i'm traveling to see a customer and I don't mind it at all. And I, um, yeah, I don't, it's not like a physically demanding job. It's not very stressful. My boss is amazing. I get great benefits. I get a car allowance, great 401k match. Like it's hard for me to just to walk away from like a six figure salary and all the benefits. Um, so I'm, I'm, I, I don't mind it. Plus I get the added income that I get from my side business, which is honestly going which is such an amazing thing that I have this side business that's going towards paying off my student debt. Mm-hmm. So I'm 
in a way at student debt and using that for student debt and allowing me to like have things like a horse and being able to like, you know, if like, for example, I'm going to Dallas next weekend to see my friend for her birthday. And then the weekend after I'm going to Denver to see one of my, my old roommate at a concert. And like, I mean, I have the flexibility to do those things and, you know, make money and not stress. So I don't know why I would leave it. It would be cool to do my, my, my company's called Revival, do Revival full time. But I think at this point, it's not really something quite on the horizon because I think it's just something that I enjoy doing part time. Well, and your full time job isn't getting in the way either. Right. It's not like impacting and and it's not to the point where you're like, oh, my God, I have to get out of here. So that's a no. very, very good position to be in. And it seems like it, I guess, never say never, it could get to that point. But for the time yeah. being, you are there because you enjoy it. You're not there because you necessarily have to be. So I think that that's a very big difference between somebody who wants to start something on their own and is in a day job that they do not enjoy. They are almost at the point where they feel like they have to get out. Um, whereas for you, you are chasing two passions and you've found a way to balance that and be able to do both of them. Yeah, exactly. And that's what makes me really happy is this job allows me so much flexibility my boss is always like, you know, if you're not traveling to see a customer, he's like, I don't care if you're working from your apartment, from Mars, from a rooftop in Spain, just like make sure you're getting your work done. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really cool. Like I can work at WeWork, like let's say, I, you know, I can go to Denver and like be with my friends or I can go to Dallas or, you know, I can be anywhere that I want to be as long as I'm able to travel to see customers and I'm able to get my work done. So like, I can do this podcast in the morning, you know, because like I'm after this, I'm able to like do my work and talk about meat science and follow up with some customers and then follow up with clients for revival. And, um, you know, sometimes I'll do a workout in the middle of the day or, you know, great groceries. And I'm, I'm never, I never feel trapped. Right. That's the things I love. Right. Which I think is, is very, very important regardless of what you're doing, right. As someone who is doing it for themselves, you shouldn't feel trapped. And that's a conversation that I have and it seems to be a lot on Instagram, but you know, people are like, Oh, I, I, you know, I could never run. I hate running or, you know, this and that. Well, that's fine. But you know, you don't have to, right. You shouldn't feel trapped. Right. Like if you want to lose weight, you can do that without running, right. You can do that with still eating pizza. And, and these are some of the things that you really, really talk about on your Instagram page when it comes to your nutrition side, and helping people, maybe helping people lose weight, but also helping people realize that it doesn't have to be like the specific focus. And I think, and I told you this before, and I've, I've said it and I've reposted it a million times, but the post that you put up about how to enjoy a barbecue, and you didn't say on a diet, I'm trying to remember specifically kind of like what the wording was, but it was essentially like making smart choices um, at a barbecue and, and how to make choices that are still going to keep you on track, but also still allow you to enjoy yourself while at a barbecue over the summer. Um, and it yeah. was just something that like really resonated with me. And it was like, it was so simple, right? And you, you put it you were very upfront about it, which is how you are with all of your posts. But at the same time, you were just very, you were almost gentle about it too. Like you, you, I don't know. It was just the way that it was written. It was just, it resonated with me big time. So I think that your delivery, and like I told you before, your, your passion, you can definitely see that and feel it in, in the way that some of these things are, are written on Instagram. So my hat goes off to you for that one. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I'm always just trying to, you know, show people that like, you don't have to consistently be on a diet. We don't have to constantly be chasing this next low weight. Like what about just living a healthy life of like finding good food balance, eating food that you enjoy, making sure you're looking at a vegetable every now and then eating enough, getting good sleep, making memories with your friends. Like 
you know, it's not hard to just prioritize making sure that you're just living your best life. Like there, people are just going crazy out there about trying to shrink themselves when it's like, you can shrink yourself all you want, but you're not shrinking your problem. Mm -hmm. You're going to lose all that weight and your problems are still going to be there. Mm -hmm. And then what come then, then what? You know, and I think when people realize that, like, once they let go of constantly the idea that they constantly need to shrink themselves, they start kind of realizing, like, man, I am in actually in control of, my, of more than just my body weight. I'm in control of my life. And I can choose to, you know, eat this. And I, I, I can choose to, you know, just, you know, take a rest day instead of feeling like I need to work out every day. I can choose to develop a new hobby outside of the gym. It's like, what happens if, like, all of a sudden you lost both your limbs, right? Or you break your neck and you no longer can go to the gym. Do you have any other hobbies or passions or has your whole life been solely identified by being an athlete? And a lot of people are like, Whoa, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know what the hell I would, I, I don't know what I would do. I'm like, yeah, go figure it out because there's more to you than like, I used to literally think that I was Livy Ron weightlifter. Mm-hmm. It took me a long time to understand that I'm Libby Ron, dietitian, sister, daughter, friend, equestrian, you know, weightlifter, like all these are things that I like doing. And not just Libby Ron weightlifter. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's very important. And it's very important to have things that are, I, I, I mean, listen, I am a triathlete. I love triathlons. I love competing, but, um, Unfortunately, this year, I actually had to take a step back and it wasn't because of health reasons. It wasn't because of, um, you know, I was too far into it, but I realized that because I had to take a step back, how far into it I really was and how I was almost getting to the point where I didn't enjoy the training anymore. I was doing the training because I felt like I had to, to get to where I wanted to go. Um, and this weekend on Saturday is the first time that I'm going into a race and I have no idea how it's going to go. Like it could go really, really well. And I could be in better shape than I think I'm in, or it could go, you know, about average for me. Um, but either way, there's really no pressure for this race because you know, it is what it is at this point. Like this could potentially be the one and only triathlon that I get to do this season. Whereas previously I had done, you know, five, six, seven, eight races per season. And although it's not a bad thing that I have, you know, this hobby that is keeping me healthy and keeping me alive, um, it was getting to a point where it was too much. And it was kind of defining, right. it was defining who I was becoming as a person. Um, and looking back now, I can see that, you know, but hindsight's always twenty twenty. So I'm, sure. you know, I'm in the same boat as you. It was like, okay, let's, you know, let's reevaluate this and let's find some other things. And so I did, like I, I found some other activities that I enjoy doing in the off season. I go skiing. Absolutely love it. Like there's just so many other things out there that, um, that you can do. And I think when you take a step back is, is going to be when you realize it. And the hard part is it takes a lot, it's usually something pretty jarring for a lot of people to take a step back. Yes. You know, that's the hardest part is you're like, why can't we just like, why can't we still love, for example, you love triathlon. It's like, okay, cool. Or like for me, like I love weightlifting, but sometimes you just have to take a step back and realize I am not going to the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Like, why am I putting myself through this? Like I remember constantly trying to cut weight and like make myself be this tiny little athlete and compete as a 48 kilo weightlifter, which is 105 pounds and restrict my food and like do all this extra exercise and sit in the sauna and like to make weight, give myself an enema, like insane, insane things. For what? I am not going to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. This is not helping me be healthy. This is not helping me have balance and live a good life. I would lose my shit. I actually lost my first job, my first corporate job out of grad school because um, I had my perfectly prepped meal like for lunch in the refrigerator. 
and I went to the fridge and it got thrown away. On I think they were cleaning out the fridge and they, they threw my lunch away. And I had a complete meltdown. I'm crying. I'm freaking out. I'm like losing my mind. Like, what am I going to eat? Like, I'm just a mess because someone threw away my lunch. Like, the most, like, okay, well, I'll just go get it. Like, why? And I couldn't think, like, oh, I'll just go, like, go buy lunch somewhere. Like, no big deal. No, I went and, like, binge ate food, had a complete meltdown. And my boss, like, that was so unprofessional. Like, that's not unacceptable. Like, today is your last day. Like, uh, two days later, like, I literally got let, let go. Wow. Because I had a meltdown over my lunch. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you just lose sight of what's really important when you get so fixated on tricking yourself. And, like, you get so far removed from what is actually healthy, what is actually good for you. What's going to help you be, you know, like in 30 years, is this going to help me be a healthy person? You know, that's, at the end of the day, that's what really matters. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Livy, I want to, you know, kind of wrap things up. I know you said you have a flexible schedule, but I do want to be respectful of the amount of sure. time that you have. And I do want to say thank you for the amount of time um, that you have given me. And you had mentioned it earlier, but I want to just unpack this a little bit more. And it's the last thing that I do want to unpack because you had mentioned that, you know, sometimes people might say to you like, oh, you must have had it easy and things like that. Um, but clearly you, yeah. you haven't. Um, and I want you to kind of put yourself back in those shoes back before you found Kyle and started dating Kyle. Um, and you were in your section eight housing, you know, living there illegally back, back to that, that point in your life. Um, and imagine there's somebody else out there that's in that point, right? I'm sure there's somebody out there somewhere who is at that point, but they are coming to the realization that they need to make a change. They know that they have to do something, but they're not sure what it is that they, they, they have to do. They don't know how to take that first step. They have been contemplating and, and analyzing and sitting on the sidelines and they're ready to go. They just haven't taken that first step yet, right? So my question for you is, what do you have in your tool belt that you could say to that person to help them take that first step and really get going on this journey of doing it for themselves. So the big thing that I always say is everything that we need to know, we already know. And it just takes action. So like just one foot in front of the other and then progress isn't linear. You might fall down, but it's that resiliency and the ability to get back up when you fall down and keep going and know that this, is it the end, right? If it, if it was the end, you'd be dead. This isn't the end. There's more and bigger things out there for you and anything is possible if you just literally put one foot in front of the other and keep working towards the goal. Like what, and finding what you're passionate about. Like what, when you wake up in the morning, lights you up and puts a fire in your life. Because at the end of the day, if you're just like going to work or doing something boring and it's like going, doing the nine to five, going home, watching Netflix and then going to sleep and repeat, that's not a very fun life to live. Find your passion. Find what like, you know, burns a fire in your heart. Take one foot in front of the other and start working towards it. And just keep doing it. Because maybe at first it doesn't work and you fail and you fall down and, you know, it's really hard and you're seeing all these people on Instagram who are just doing all these things and you're like, that's not me. I really couldn't do it. And you're like, but you can. And because whatever you tell yourself, you tell yourself, I can't do it. That becomes reality. And that becomes the truth. So the more you tell yourself and look yourself in the mirror and say, I can freaking do this. That's your reality. And that's what's going to happen. Awesome. 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 Well, Livy, again, I just want to say thank you for coming on the podcast this morning. Um, I, of course. I really, really appreciate your time that you have given me to, to come on the podcast. Um, but I also really appreciate your openness and your honesty um, here on the podcast today. So thank you for sharing your full and complete story um, here on the Do It For Yourself podcast. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Of course, you too. Thank you. 
So that is my interview with Livy. And again, not knowing that a meat scientist was a career that someone could pursue, um, I, I learned this after the fact, which is great because I love utilizing the podcast, not only to meet new people, but also to learn new things. So that was something that was really cool to learn. And I've since been following some of um, Livy's meat scientist posts that she's putting up. Um, she just put one up the other day about the process that she was going through for chicken wings. And I must say that the chicken wings, once they were done, looked absolutely delicious. Um, so I would love to know your thoughts on this, uh, your thoughts on Livy's story, and your thoughts on her transforming from somebody who was really, really struggling struggling after um, her injury to her successful career now. And if you think of it, you get a chance, reach out to Livy, send her a message, leave her a comment, and just let her know um, that you listened to this episode and that you enjoyed it. While you are thinking of it, please, if you could do me a favor and take a few minutes to leave a review on the Apple Podcast app or whatever app it is you are listening to this podcast. It's something that would help me out. And I would greatly appreciate you taking a couple minutes to do that. If you are interested in supporting this show in a different way, you can also go to the doitforyourself.com forward slash support. And that is going to take you directly to our Patreon page if that is something that you would also be interested in. That is it. That is all I have for you. Thank you for coming and hanging out this week on the podcast, and I look forward to seeing you for the next episode.